And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is my good brother here in the temple, making his triumphant return, the man behind Ghast Bashers, the game that I infamously mis mispronounced in my first entry, with in my first entry with him, the one and only library NPC, Anthony Domingo. Hello, thank you for having me back here at the temple. Yeah, thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, I, I realize it's been it's about two years since I last had you on. Yeah, it's, that's really been a uh, very crazy two years, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've yet to see a I've yet to see a sane span of two years, but that's just me. Ah, uh, that's that's not wrong. <laughs> that's really not wrong, especially in the last five years. I really am on these kind of things. You know, people are always surprised by it. Yeah, well. And then and then they call me arrogant. Which, it's not if you're arrogant. Right, you're right. <laughs> it's not arrogance if it's true. You got a point there. But with that, with that said, obviously the last time I had you on was for gas bashers, and there's been a few. Other, there's been a few other things in the interim, but you've made your triumphant return to Kickstarter with this latest project known as We Boomers. And since I did the humble beginnings the last time I had you on, let's instead shift into how this how this particular idea came about. So part of the idea was uh, another one of those random things that uh, spawned from other games I was already working on. And part of it was I was stuck in traffic for about two hours due to an overturned truck and had an idea so uh so it's just chewing on the idea while i was driving uh because i was mentally revisiting some of the projects that uh occurred before i even finished gas bashers uh a lot of the systems of gas bashers came about because of those previous projects so i just kept chewing on the idea and at the time my uh, my commute for my job was anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes so there was a lot of driving time to chew on the idea and then I said to myself, well, why not uh, do that really bad Western approach to a slice of life anime and how we all live it? And then We A Boomers was born. Mm -hmm. And for those who have not looked at the Kickstarter yet, We A Boomers is your D12 powered comedy anime inspired role playing game based off of anime from the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, and the anime fans that grew up with it, who are now currently dealing with wonderful things such as uh, moderate joint pain and depression. Mm -hmm. And the way the... With the way you, en with the way you ended up describing it, um, the, the idea of... Of um you of you were never you were never like the protagonist given powers at a young age, but what if that were to happen now as as an adult? Exactly. Um, uh, so instead of uh, getting your magical girl transformation at thirteen, your talking animal showed up when you were thirty, coming out of an HOA meeting. You didn't have five hot aliens living with you when you were sixteen. Instead, they literally crashed into your apartment when you're forty two. You didn't unlock any cool key powers at 18. Instead, they came out during your yearly review at 50. Essentially, you got your anime call to adventure at a much later point in your life, but the problem is you still have to juggle all of your real-world responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say, I'm going to go be an anime protagonist now and go on an adventure, because you still have to worry about your shift at uh, work the next day or you know, your freelance gig or, you know, kids or, you know, HOAs and things like that. It's a very tongue-in-cheek 
dealing with uh, the life that we're all living and the the fantasy that we all wish we had when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. Now, this brings me to my first question, because with everything that you said, that's a wide variety of genres. And a lot of... And you, you're probably familiar with this just as much as I am. A lot of quote-unquote anime RPGs tried to tackle a bunch of genres at once and ended up being downstream from a universalist RPG like, God help you, GURPS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Within, so, my ne- so my next question is... How is how do you make sure that it that it doesn't fall into full um full universalist trying to and trying to deal with so many different genres? So this is where I get to do the twofold thing of um breaking out that invincible meme of how do you do this? And then, you know, the answer is well you don't. Uh there are certain parts of this that are very much a universal RPG. Uh some of the core DNA and some of the structure is uh inspired by powered by the apocalypse games in which you know you roll your dice and add your mods compare it to a table and go from there it's just uh you're rolling different dice and a different quantity of dice at the end of the day uh you know different table and so on and so forth so like the core element technically is from a universal setting or universal system but the rest of it is where the unique elements start coming in you know, we have, uh, what I was gunning for in this is you're not doing your standard, oh, you're just an a- super-powered anime protagonist and that's it. No, you still have your, uh, you know, your roots in real life going on here. So right there, that's already going to detract from some of the themes that you have in other anime-inspired games like uh, Big Eye Small Mouth or uh, OVA. Uh, or even just, you know, all of the various anime hacks for your favorite universal system or your favorite overhyped dragon game. Uh, but that all out. <laughs> the term we uh, like to use is the world's most litigious role-playing game. I mean, I think it's the world's most overhyped role-playing game, but I'll I'll agree with you on that one. There's enough lawyers that I know that still play the game and love it. Uh yeah, and I'm, but, I'm pretty. Sh- I'm pretty sure a bunch of them really can't stand me because I keep clowning on grogs. I mean, to each their own. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm not uh, not gonna pick a fight on that one right now because I have way too much Dayquil in my system to pick that fight. Oh, <laughs> but well, to, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Your... I'll p- I'll pick the fight on yeah. your behalf. Thank you. Uh, but to go back to uh, the question, though, is that, again, there's going to be some elements that are very much a universal game, and you could turn this into a um, you know, a role-playing game of a setting of your choice, uh, but the a lot of the system that's built into it is going to be tied to having that idea of being somebody who has been gifted these unexpected powers and still have your responsibilities. Um, you know, I guess if you were to get rid of the anime or comic appeal uh, and reduce a lot of the comedy, it uh, is going to be closer to a game like Part-Time Gods or um, a uh, less jet-setting version of Scion. But it's, you know, because of the tongue-in-cheek nature and the slice-of-life elements, it's not going to be a perfect universal system. And the goal of it with uh, the anime side is just to touch base on the various types of anime that were popular during, again, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, and then go from there. This way, like, uh, a lot of the inspirations I was relying on were things like Sailor Moon, Tenchi Moyo. Essentially, the Toonami block was a huge inspiration for this game. Yeah, we've, that little... we, yeah. Have co- <laughs> we have covered that, we have covered that, um... That particular era quite extensively on on the, on this, and even more recently when I was laughing at people watch who um, went through one of Toonami's infamous April Fool's gags not too long ago, specifically mm. that specifically when they decided to play um, mind game in in Japanese on April Fool's Day, and even <laughs> even had <laughs> Tom and Sarah dubbed in Japanese. And then called back oh, to it man. later with Tom, with Tom going, I have no memory of what of what happened. You know, like you like he <laughs> treated the whole thing as a bad trip. 
Which, yeah. You know, given some of the stuff that's been that's been on the network and given some of the stuff that William Street has done, treating it like a bad trip is on point. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very good idea. But the th- and the the big reason why it was a laugh it for me at least is because I had seen Mind Game before. I knew exactly what I was getting into. Um, that is the brainchild of Masaki Yuasa, who throughout his entire work, which is very interesting, he keeps trying to see how much he can get away with and still have it count as animation. Mm. Yeah, I can't say I've seen that one, so... Uh, it's weird. Like, the most normal thing is the protagonist outrunning God. Huh. I mean, there is a reason what there is a reason why, and the reason makes sense in universe, but it is going to be very, very weird. Hmm. Oh. But hmm. with the, but even with all even with that in mind, the I think as I, now as I recall this is going to be using the D12 setup that you did for Ghast Bashers. Mm. <laughs> oh. So, uh, when I made the uh, the comment about it has some of that DNA from Powered by the Apocalypse, mm-hmm. um, one of the, in fact, like, one of the only elements you will actually see from Powered by the Apocalypse in here is you're rolling uh, your dice and comparing it to a table. So unlike Gast Bashers, where you had to meet a certain number of successes to baseline succeed or a certain number of successes against a, uh, a floating difficulty like your targets and whatnot, in this you actually are rolling 2d12, adding your mods, and comparing it to the table, which has uh, your range of uh, failure, no but, uh, yes, yes but... Uh, and also includes a range for criticals, because we all love that uh, that swingy crit when it finally does happen. And uh, with uh, a lot of old school anime being tied to thirteen episodes or divisible by thirteen episodes, thirteen or numbers divisible by thirteen are your crits. Mm-hmm. So it that is where the powered by the apocalypse nod comes in of roll your two dice, add your mods compared to the table. Mm-hmm. And that's about as far as we go into with powered by the apocalypse. Number- uh, so it is entirely different than what you've seen in gas bashers, as well as my other games, including niche, uh, dualities, data drivers, uh, smack, like all of them, they're all going to be different. And uh, we are boomers with no exception to that rule. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, how with uh, since you mentioned PBTA, I'm, I f- I feel compelled to ask if you are going to be dipping into the u- the use of playbooks or not, or oh, is it no. be free form? Absol- absolutely not. Uh, when uh, one of the things that I hated about Powered by the Apocalypse, in fact, two th- main things I hated were the playbooks and the moves. I felt that moves were too restrictive, and I felt that playbooks uh, got in the way more than they helped. Unless you, unless you're somebody who deals with decision paralysis and are not used to free form role playing games, which some newbies are not, and some people like to have a limited selection of options. I felt it got in my way for a lot of the games I design, so I just said no. I that's why I don't write Powered by the Apocalypse games, but I'll still borrow some of the DNA from it because there's some good stuff in there. It's just has a lot of stuff I don't like. So no, there will not be playbooks inside of Wii Boomers, and we will not have uh, a limited uh, collection of moves in Wii Boomers either. Mm-hmm. So no, that's that's not part of it. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. So the whole thing will be free form. Mm-hmm. So with the with that in with that in mind, um, is it a case where the where the the um the results of yes 
yes, yes, and no, 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 but is that is that static? Uh, what do you mean by is it static? Do you mean like are the results on the table static or? Yeah, the tar the like... target numbers for those for those thresholds um, static. Yes, the target numbers are going to be static because there's not a uh, there's not a ton of modifiers in this uh, because the I wanted to lean on the uh, the anime and comic book style progression where when an upgrade occurs it's a big one but a lot of those upgrades are very focused or specific like uh, when you look at things like uh, Tenchi Moyo. You know, you had Tenchi who had zero idea what his powers were. Then he figured out how to use the sword. Then he figured out uses for the sword. Then he got the, his battle transformation and the light hawk wings. And he was building up these powers as he went. But they were all, like, very focused on specific things. Like, they didn't all stack together all that much. Uh, depending on how you looked at it. Mm -hmm. Or if, you know, you look at Outlaw Star... Uh, you know, Gene's caster is an entirely different entity from the rest of his arsenal or what, uh, you know, the Outlaw Star itself can do. So I I was approaching that type of methodology for uh, character progression. So you're only, you know, you're building up a collection of bonuses, but a lot of them are going to be tied to specific powers that you're developing or in a collection of what are called for you quirks are the things going mm -hmm. against you uh so you know for example when you build your first character your one of your perks could be that you were the star football player for your high school team and won a championship so you know that comes with reputation comes with certain skills so on and so forth but your quirk is you could be working at a dead-end job at a shoe store mm -hmm. so it's that idea of you know you here's your area to get a bonus and here's an area to really modify the narrative but again there there's a limited uh variety of them and there's only so many you could stack at one time to really push the boundaries uh so you're not gonna find a way to get like plus 12 uh on a roll to guarantee that you're going to get that success Mm -hmm. uh, but you do have other ways to add a, you know additional dice or re-rolls or things of that nature so you don't have that power creep of constantly gaining plus one, plus one, plus one. It's more of a, uh, how can I mix and match these things to help tell the story? Which is, and that's, it is interesting you bring that up because in, bo in, both co in both comics and in manga, full-on upgrades are rare and more often you see side grades or, th mm -hmm. or things that are temporary. Yeah. Or, you know, even though that the upgrade is now in existence, that upgrade only counts for so long. Uh, you know, like, okay, your character has gained this really cool new weapon, but now the enemies that you're fighting are on par with that weapon. So that big upgrade you got is only doing so much for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I've also, one of the other inspirations for this were uh, some tokusatsu, like Kamen Rider and Super Sentai. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been watching a lot of Kamen Rider lately because I'm finally catching up on it. And, you know, it's amazing at how many upgrades your main character gets, but also just how fast those upgrades are meaningless. Or in, in some cases, upgrades where there's a lot of um, risk involved with it. Um, mm -hmm. Like, there, there's, always, there's been plenty of upgrades throughout Kamen Rider that are, that are essentially berserk upgrades. Um, yes. If huh? I was saying yeah. Um, if I'd use if I'd use one recent example, probably um, Black Hazard in um, build. You yeah, know, I haven't gotten that far in build. I actually just got to uh, the uh, the slash uh, was it the slash driver mm -hmm. was just introduced, which so. that that leans into into that mindset as well because of what it does to its <laughs> users but yeah um, uh one of the ones that i would uh lean on because i've finished that one not too long ago was the uh primitive dragon uh form in common rider saber mm -hmm. uh, and usually that berserk only lasts a certain 
a certain amount of time, but I will I often bring up as a test um the the limited time type of effects. One of the big ones that comes to mind is um Axel in um Fies. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to move absurdly fast but only for 10 seconds. So let let me use that as a way to go ahead and uh, you know open a door on one of the other systems that's introduced in the game. That way you can get a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. and how it can help differentiate between some of the other games that you and I are familiar with that we could do some of this with, but not to the degree we might want. So mm -hmm. when I uh, when I built the game, I really wanted to to be like my other games, easily accessible, quick to learn, and ideally something that you could pick up and run at a convention pretty quickly. And We A Boomers thrives whenever I can go to a convention with a bunch of cosplayers, get them to sit down and play the, you know, play the game. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, perfect examples here is I would sit down at a con, get the cosplayers at a table and say, okay, let's build your character. You get three perks. Tell me three things about yourself that and your life that you really love. Let's turn them into uh, stats real quick. Now tell me three things that are going on in your life that are just absolutely garbage that you hate. We'll plug them in as your quirks. Then you build your collection of uh, powers. The first tier of powers are your special effects. These are things that let you do something that is normally impossible for a normal human. So, like, you know, your magical girl might have, you know, her transformation, uh, access to a magical element, and, you know, being able to talk to animals. Mm -hmm. You know, simple, small things, but they really, like, shape the narrative. So the SFX are things that shape the narrative. Your secondary powers, which I'm blanking on the name right now because I've been, I've been having a time, because I'm tight. Uh, your second tier of powers are set up to actually give you bonuses. Mm -hmm. So these are the things like your um, your bread and butter special attacks that are not like your signature, but they're still special. Um, so like you know, for a uh, for a common rider, it could be you know a uh, a specific form uh, when they have multiple forms, or it might be a signature weapon. Uh, for like a magical girl, it could be, um, you know, a uh, a special power that unlocks when they transform that enhances their abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a um, you know, when you're looking at uh, even mecha pilots, uh, you know, just some of the uh, the mid tier abilities of their mecha that would actually give them bonuses to act. Uh, you know, like uh, the Wing Zero system from Gundam Wing could technically be one of these powers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like your mid-tier, where these actually give you static bonuses, and these can stack with your other bonuses. And then you finally get into your signatures, and signatures are your big, like, they're your finishing moves. They're your world-breaking capabilities. But the problem is that they all come at a cost. And, uh, you know, like games like Fate or Cortex, there's, of course, going to be a, uh, a point currency available to players. And they are accessed by your terrible failures, like your crit fail or your no butt, uh, or, you know, how you would end up getting some of these uh, power points, for lack of a better term. And you use these, uh, you know, this currency to activate these powers, which essentially give you an extra D12 to your pool. So these are the, you know, again, these are your big, like, named attacks. This is your rider kick. This is your, uh, you know, uh, whichever version of Sailor Moon's finishing move you want to use, depending on which season you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your swordsman's signature, I'm going to cut someone in half, like uh, Kenshin's uh, Amakakura Ryu no Hiromeki. Mm -hmm. Like, just, like, the absolutely bonkers... Uh, you know the big moves, and that's I, where those fall in. I should I should note that I I remember I remember one of my acquaintances finding it finding it strange that um you have characters announcing the announcing their finishers um, and I I had told him once you un, once you understand how Kabuki works um mm -hmm. 
it ends up making a whole lot more sense. There's a certain setup pose that's used in a lot of Kabuki plays called Mie. And, of course, it's also important to note that Kabuki, in a, in a roundabout way, is akin to professional wrestling. Oh. Um, you know, you, ha you have... You've, pro you've probably seen the outfits that ka that Kabuki actors wear. There is nothing mm -hmm. subtle about it. If you want subtlety, no is over that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is it is very it is very loud. It is very colorful. Um, you have cr you have crowds getting very into the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that ki that kind of thing is at the is at the core of it. And oh, it's so, it's something that is something that one one also has to take into account when when de when dealing with trying to emulate that cuz I've talked about this elsewhere, but a, but a, a significant there's a significant trap that ends up happening when it comes to this idea of emulating anime in one form or another, and that is um, treating it as if it as if everything is assigned to one genre. Mm -hmm. I'm get, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's part of the reason you went you went with this approach of. Um, of going with the one specific theme, but not limiting it to one specific genre. Well, like I'm leaning on, I'm very much leaning into the uh, the themes of like your slice of life, but implementing from the uh, the other popular genres of anime. Mm -hmm. So you know, you can bring in your sci-fi, you can bring in your magical girl, you can bring in your uh, your harem rom-com isekai if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. it, it it's built to do that sort of thing, but it's still not a it's not going to cover every genre known to mankind. But it's built to allow the, the introduction <laughs> of elements <clears throat> of all of these different uh, all these different themes and genres into one spot. Yeah, I Hopefully can I can get that. Um, like I said, kind of like Haze a Day Quill here, so it's like, am I coherent? Am I just being weird? Let's find out. <laughs> That's a good question. The answer is yes. No. <laughs> I mean, I know this is like the big uh, the big drinking uh, shit show of the internet, as you say, mm -hmm. but, you know, right now my drink choice is, uh, you know, wonderful Day Quill to shake off whatever con crud that's been trying to kill me over, you know, seven weeks of consecutive events. Yeah, I I can get that. I know I know Nomnivore is const is almost constantly <laughs> on on the con train. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it and well if well if if it were if it weren't for the fact that I'm in that I'm in the middle of the Midwest, I'd probably end up showing up to more because there's not a whole there's not a whole lot because it's too damn cold half the year. Yeah. But with, and of course, I am curious what um, prompted what prompted um, um, Kasaba to be the unofficial mascot of the Kickstarter. <laughs> so uh, I was working with uh, uh, with Ryan, one of the artists that uh, I've tapped for the project. And uh, I mentioned that I wanted a critter of some sort. I wanted to have our tongue-in-cheek version of a magical girl talking animal mascot. You know, because, let's face it, you know, uh, cute animals or cute critters uh, tend to sell for uh, for certain anime. You know, like uh, every magical girl series had its critter, like, you know, Luna and Artemis and Sailor Moon... Uh, you had Makona in Ray Earth and uh, similar clamp titles. Uh, you even had uh, Kube in uh, Madoka Magica. To a point, uh, yes. To a point, yes. But point still stands. You see where I'm going here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then you had other uh, characters like Intenshi. Again, you had um, Rio Oki. Yeah. So you know, and uh, like even Cowboy Bebop had Ein. 
Like, you know, you, you, critters, uh, critters definitely get the point across. Uh, so as we were kicking around ideas, uh, he mentioned the idea of a uh, Casa Obake, uh, which is a uh, type of... Um, Oh boy, the uh, type of yokai uh, mm -hmm. that is made from a uh, old discarded umbrella, and mm -hmm. we, as we were kicking around, I'm like, no, I love this idea. The idea of a old discarded umbrella is now the mascot for an anime based on middle aged anime fans that are, you know, feeling disenfranchised, burned out, and overused, mm -hmm. and just discarded. I'm like, huh. You know, so I have to give credit where credit's due. Uh, it was one of those cute ideas that uh, we were bouncing around back and forth, and Ryan even said, no, this is a really good idea. And I said, you know, you're right. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. So uh, next thing I know, uh, we uh, we had Kasaba put together. Um, I, I wanted to give it a name that was going to be silly and still on point. So Kasa Ba uses the kanji for Kasa umbrella and the same Ba that's used in Obachan for old lady. Mm -hmm. So literally it's a, you know, it's old lady umbrella <laughs> if you want to get technical. Uh, and it's it's kind of funny to, uh, to think about, especially with the fact that kanji is also used for trickster, which is a nice little nod to, again, that whole Kyubei thing. Mm-hmm. You know, where the uh, the little mascot is usually more than what you would expect. So that's what we were going for. Just something, again, something silly, something relatable. And that was the end result. Mm -hmm. I'm quite happy with how that went. Yeah. <clears throat> now, it definitely sounds like you've been, you've been hit, you've been doing a whole lot of playtesting in the, um, con in the convention scene. Were there, were there any parts with say character creation that some people had a bit had a bit of um stumbling with especially regarding things like yep. quirks uh actually the uh, most recent convention i tried to run it which was uh Tsubasa-Con, um i i had players that just weren't grokking the uh the concept um you know the they weren't like that big an anime fan so they were struggling with the very idea in the first place uh, and they were also struggling with um, the uh, like coming up with what they wanted as perks and quirks. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, a couple of the players uh, hadn't even been able to get their own perks mapped out. So yeah, uh, sometimes people do struggle with it. Yep. But you know, when I give examples of things like, hey, you know, uh, the job that you have and the steady paycheck can be a perk. Uh, you know, having a, uh, you know, a, uh, like a, a hobby that is, uh, fun or, uh, useful in some way is a perk. You know, uh, having a niche bit of knowledge is a perk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, it was that sort of thing, but some people just struggle with it. Same thing I've run into with, uh, Running Fate, uh, years ago. Uh, you know, and, like, that was still relatively new people would struggle with coming up with aspects and how they even work so yeah. it's a similar similar situation i've called this kind of thing blank check design yeah. and one th and um it's funny you mentioned fade because i've been i've always been critical of the lack of guidance when it comes to aspects mm. within within books and i'm get i'm guessing for for Wea Boomers, are you planning on putting a handful of of examples to kind of give oh, yeah. a bit of guidance? Because yeah, cause... there's there's going to be uh, there's going to be a handful of options in there uh, for guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things I'm doing with the Kickstarter is uh, people at uh, certain VIP tiers are actually pitching their own character to me, and will be making their character inside of the game and of course character sheet is provided so people can actually see some of these sample characters how they're made and what makes them tick mm -hmm. and and the not to, not to harp too hard on on um fate but it is a recurring example of, of this like it, it mm -hmm. points out that you have the concepts you have the 
high concept aspect, you have the trouble aspect, you have three freebies, but it but unless you're dealing with a specific um, setting book, if you're just using Fate Core or Accelerated or Condensed, um, you have no idea what e what either of those are going to be. I mean, you might get a sentence worth of description, but you know that's not enough. Yeah. Oh, and that's yeah, the I'm reason. Trying to, uh, I'm trying to avoid that pitfall. Yeah, and that's the reason why I asked on that because I can't. I can easily see how quirks could be a bit of an issue with people who need a bit of a not for lack of a better term need a bit of a nudge at times with mm -hmm. how they handle with how they handle characters. Yeah. You're you're definitely not wrong, and like so that's why like I tried to give those uh, those tongue in cheek examples, um, you know, like why I referenced you know like married with children with the whole football team and then being a dead end uh, job as a, as a shoe salesman. Yeah, because mm -hmm. enough people of our generation are at least familiar with married with children. Mm -hmm. So you know, making that stat at Al and you know the the good and the bad that he has going for him hopefully nudges some people to go, oh, right, this is actually something I do have going for me, and something that really is not that great. Yeah. yeah it doesn't always work, but, you know, then again, what does, what is the silver bullet to make everything work perfectly for everyone? If you know it, you know, I'd love to hear it, but I don't think it exists yet. No, it, it is about, it is about as real as uh, as as Santa Claus, the the Easter Bunny, and um, and any team in Minnesota be, um winning something. <laughs> oh, I know some will I know some will hate me for that joke, but um, don't hate me for speaking the truth. Yeah, it's, you know, not like I have any room to talk. I don't really follow the, the sports all that much, so. I do for one reason and one reason only. Shit posting. Mm. I, yeah, I get that. The yeah, shit posting is its own hobby. Mm hmm. But with that, with that in mind, oh. What would you. Now, with. Given how the given how there's a wide variety that you can go with, um, do you have plans on putting a chapter dedicated to like story seeds to help GMs kind of get a direction they they want to go in for their campaigns? Uh, yes, I actually uh, have a uh, chapter that's dedicated to um, like the world that we have in Wea Boomers and mm -hmm. the various uh, directions that it can go. Uh, because the the core setting of Wii Boomers I'm leaning in on is the idea of being in our world that we live in right now, and you know you get some of that anime encroachment. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, Mildra, are on your way home from work, and you know a spaceship crash crashes in front of you, and sa they say, "Hey, here you go. Here's this relic tied to your ancient alien bloodline. Go figure out how it works and save your world." Mm -hmm. But, you know, you still got to go to work in the morning and deal with the frigid temperatures of the Midwest as you question your new life choice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, and then just build up from that. So it's that sort of tongue in cheek. OK, you know, you're literally in our world been gifted this and some of the things that could happen and some of the directions that it can go. Like, you know, having uh, governments having an interest in people with these powers like you would have in a comic book sort of situation. Or, you know, what is causing this sort of thing? Is it an anime world encroaching on ours? Is it, uh, you know, uh, a Tulpa effect? Like, what? which way do you want to go with it? So I'm building in some seeds like that in the world chapter. But I'm also building in alternative worlds, like uh, people like the isekai, because isekai is still a popular genre. You know, how, how would you tie an isekai into this? Well, here's how you do it. Uh, you know, what about, uh, what if I want to be in an anime world already? Well, guess what? You are, you know, the, uh, the character with the mom haircut and you now are, you know, your, uh, your next Eva pilot. Congratulations. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, things like that, where it's that very much unexpected, you know, you're, instead of the typical teenage protagonist, it's now your adult that is thrown into those same situations, but already in an anime world. So I'm building in some of these things into the book. Um, and again, one of the uh, tiers for the Kickstarter is people can pitch their own world to me, so to speak. We get a uh, one of our artists on board to go ahead and draw up something specific to that type of flavor of world, and then I write a couple pages of notes for it to show how it works and how you can use it in your stories. Mm-hmm. So I should I should note as a bit of an aside. I get I got people some I got people pissed off at me something fierce because I sit. I had said that John Carter is the, is the original Isekai. I don't know if I would say original Isekai, but no, he's definitely up early on there. Uh oh. well, as, as far as far as a as far as a popular concepts, um, I would have I would have gone with Through the Looking Glass, but it's open to interpretation how much of that was actually her in another world. And how much of that was her just having a really, really, really bad trip? I mean, yeah, you're you're not wrong on that one, but you know, you can also argue that things like um, uh, what was that? Let me I'm actually gonna double check to make sure that I'm not like mixing things up because my. Again, kind of like in a haze of things. Okay, yeah, you could technically argue that something like the time machine is an isekai. Yeah, and that like, is before. That's before John Carter even. Yeah, that's what I had. To I like. Check. I like bring. <laughs> I like making this analogy with cla- with classic literature because a lot of people have this idea that isekai is the, is this brand spanking new genre when. Even if even if the name is new, the concept is not. It's been around for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. It has been. And that's some that's something that I try and um try and ha- try and hammer home. But <clears throat> now, with that said, um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? So my. My current estimate, if you know, once I get everything like converted, you you know, as we were discussing before, uh, you know, before we started recording about how we can have a bunch of pages, but then once you do layout, it gets really dicey. Um, my goal is to have somewhere between the 150, 180 page mark, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, that's after art, writing, uh, character sheets, notes, like the whole nine yards. Um, knowing my luck, like, it'll probably be on the higher end of that, if not over it, because, let's face it, Gas Bashers was only going to be a uh, 80, 90-page book, and it left at 116th. So, you know, because I just kept adding stuff that people wanted to see in it, even though I already had it written when I launched the Kickstarter, I just kept adding content people really wanted. So, uh, this is no exception. Yeah, you know, as people comment on things, I start rewriting certain elements of it, even though I, it's not written the same way Gas Bashers was. Like, I don't have the whole thing written as a text, and I'm just doing layout. I have piles of the uh, the notes I'm just compiling in just, like, the new layout as I go. But, you know, things come up, and I keep adding more. And for all I know, I'll probably be pushing 200 pages by the end of it, because that's how I roll. <laughs> but my goal is to be in that, you know, that accessible 150 range. Expect probably closer to 180, knowing me. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I will, I will certainly be keeping a close eye on how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and coming all the way to my temple to and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh no, I appreciate you uh, you know, inviting me back again, even though it's been a couple years and erratic communication over the last couple years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's always nice being back at the temple. You know, sadly I can't raise the uh the usual drink, but you know, 
<laughs> you can do so in I, I'd spirit. Like... Yeah, well, I'd like to think I'm a little bit inebriated in a different variety this time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and anytime. But hey, if we can't fit... laugh about it. Mm-hmm. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, again, always happy to be back and looking forward to the next visit. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay fucking frosty everybody <laughs>